a fair number of them. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks, Matt. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Paul Daly, and I'm going to be talking to you today about ZFS dedupe send, uh, sort of what it is, what benefits and trade offs it has, and what its future might be. Um, so I know probably a lot of you already know what it is or how it works, uh, but I'm sure there's some that don't, and I'm sure there's some people online that don't. So I want to go over sort of an introduction of terms before we get started. Um, so ZFS send is a uh, utility in ZFS that allows you to do sort of native backup and replication of data. Um, it serializes the file system. It sort of finds all of the blocks, um, writes them out over to the network or onto a tape for later use for backups. Um, it's very efficient in terms of being able to set compressed. It can do incrementals between one snapshot and another snapshot. And there's a variety of very useful features that make it a very high quality data replication and backup tool. Um, ZFS dedupe is a feature in ZFS that allows you to deduplicate the data in your pool. It will find data with the same checksums. And then rather than storing multiple copies of what is this, essentially the same data, we'll store it once and then we have references to the other copies of the data. Um, this is a very powerful tool. It can dramatically reduce your storage costs for certain workloads. Uh, but in order to keep sort of performance acceptable, it needs to store a lot of data in memory. And so it can be a very expensive feature to use in practice. It costs a lot of memory and it can cause a lot of write and read amplification as well. Um, ZFS dedupe send sounds like it has something to do with ZFS dedupe, but it doesn't. Um, other than sort of the name, there's very, and like the vague premise of we deduplicate some data, there is very little to do with each other. Uh, it does have something to do with ZFS send though, so that's good. Um, <laughs> So basically, ZFS dedupe send is a post-processing pass um, that goes over the send stream, finds uh, records that contain the same data, and then removes references to later ones and sort of points back to earlier references in the send stream. Um, it uses a special kind of record called a write by ref record that sort of points to another data set that's already been received uh, as part of the same package. Um, it has a couple problems with it. One of them is that it uses a significant amount of memory and consumes some CPU in user lands to do the processing. Um, and then it also has some cost on the receive side. And it has some complexity associated with it. I'm going to go into more detail about exactly these <coughs> last two points, because um, that's sort of the point of the talk today. Um, so to go into a few more details about how the feature works. Um, the, on the send side of dedupe send, we create a hash table in user land that is it's very similar to the dedupe table that's stored in the kernel when you're using dedupe. It's a mapping from a checksum to a combination of a snapshots GUID, the object in that data set, and the offset within that object. Um, so that's how it does sort of the back referencing to previously received data. Um, it's sort of every time it sees a new record, it looks at the checksum. If it's a new checksum, it stores it in the hash table. If it's an old one, it will uh, find the value already in the hash table and replace the entire record with a write by ref record pointing to the other data. Um, all of the processing for this happens in a single thread in user land. Um, and it has absolutely no connection to ZFS dedu. Whether you have ZFS dedu enabled or not, uh, whether your dedu is table is stored, stored in memory, stored on disk, whatever's going on with it, this just doesn't, it doesn't know about it, it doesn't talk to it, it has nothing to do with it. Um, many people don't realize this. I actually talked to some people yesterday who thought that uh, it took advantage of the DDT, but it does not. And this is one of its many misleading features. Um, on the receive side, when you're receiving one of these write by ref records, um, you have the GUID of the snapshot that the data is stored in, the object in that snapshot, and the offset within that object. Uh, and so your next step is you have to go and open that snapshot, find that object in that snapshot, and like hold the appropriate debuff with the data so you can write it into the correct location. Um, there is no sort of standard map between GUIDs and snapshots in the kernel. Um, so when you're doing a ZFS receive, what we do is we build a mapping of all of the snapshots received as part of that receive command. Like when you type ZFS receive on the command line, that is one command. Um, and so we build a map from GUID to a snapshot over the course of a command and then keep track of all of the receives that are part of the same command by passing data to and from the kernel. Um, <laughs> once we have sort of found the right snapshot, we hold the right debuff, we copy the data from the existing snapshot into the new snapshot. And again, if you have dedupe enabled or not on the target, 
it doesn't matter. None of this is relevant. To, like, it doesn't take advantage of that. It isn't better or worse. Um, if you have dedupe enabled, probably the blocks will dedupe, but maybe they won't. I don't know. ZFS is weird sometimes. Um, so there's a couple problems with dedupe send receive. Um, one of them is that you have to store this sort of pseudo dedupe table in user land on the sending side. Um, and that consumes memory. It's not a huge amount of memory. It's, you're not storing it for the entire size of your pool. But if you're doing large replications, it can take a non-trivial amount of memory. Um, in addition, it adds more CPU load to the sending process um, and adds just yet another place in the send process where you can have a CPU bottleneck. Um, it doesn't have any sort of super gross architectural features on the sending side, unlike the receiving side. Um, so on the receiving side, uh, this map between snapshot and GUID actually needs to persist over multiple uh, calls to the receive ioptal. And so a token is sort of passed back and forth between the user and the kernel to keep track of this state. And that data needs to get freed when the process finally finishes doing its job using some uh, on-exit callbacks that are used in here and one or two other places, but not a lot. Um, you also have to read the data from the other data set when you're like uh, receiving a BIREF record. Um, and that involves doing a demand read before you can do your write, which can potentially increase latency and decrease your bandwidth. Um, there should be prefetching to help make it better, but prefetching does not always do what you want it to do, especially in uh, sort of high IO uh, situations. Um, overall, the big drawback to this feature is that when you're doing a ZFS send, this GDU feature only works within one send command. Um, so if you're doing like a normal send or an incremental, that's one snapshot and the data in that one snapshot that you can dedupe against. If you're doing a send with dash R or dash I, the capital R and I, which will allow you to send multiple data sets, you have a larger space that you can dedupe over, but you also spend a lot more memory storing this dedupe table uh, in user land. Um, and so for a lot of use cases, dedupe actually isn't going to get you very much because you don't store a lot of copies of the same data in the same data set. Um, and of course, much like normal DDoP and ZFS, only works on whole blocks. Um, in this case, it also only works if the checks and algorithms being used on the different data sets are the same, which is usually true, but not always. Um, and then one of the big problems is that this isn't a feature that a lot of people use. Um, a lot of tools don't take advantage of it. A lot of users don't use it. And so it's not super well tested. And every time we come up with a new feature in ZFS send, we have to expand the test matrix to cover this. Um, I know there were some issues with raw sends for encryption uh, where there were crash bugs um, relating to dedupe sends and raw sends being combined because it's difficult to cover all the different possibilities when you're writing tests. Um, and so it adds maintenance cost, it adds development cost, it adds code bloat, it has a bunch of sort of development focused downsides in addition to the actual downsides of using it. Um, so sort of the question that this talk is intended to ask is what happens if we deprecate? Um, and this is an interesting question because we've never really deprecated a feature like this in ZFS before. Um, ZFS has always sort of had a very strong philosophy and a very good philosophy that the data should be made. You should always be able to keep your data. You should always be able to look at old data and sort of with new bits, load old pools and still get all the functionality. And with new receive bits, receive your old streams and be able to restore your backups. Um, but as sort of the file system grows and we add more features and time goes on, if we never remove anything, the code base will grow without bounds and complexity will grow and it will become harder and harder to maintain and understand all of this logic. Um, so even if dedupe send isn't the thing to remove, it's a good template to think about what deprecation should look like for ZFS. Uh, how do we want to do something like this if we decide that we do need to remove features to make our lives easier as developers? Um, so we would probably so this is a proposal for how we would do this for dedupe send. Um, we would start in much the same way that you de deprecate basically any feature from any programming language or utility. Um, you start throwing warnings when people use it. You note in the man page or remove it from the man page uh, that the feature is going to be deprecated. Uh, eventually, you would remove the flag from ZFS send. Maybe you'd have like a special super secret backup flag for people who like actually need to use it for something. Um, eventually, you remove that. And then after a while, when people have sort of gotten used to it, you remove it from the logic from libzfs on the sending side. Um, and then before you actually remove the receive logic, uh, you could create some sort of utility that would de-deduplicate the data. 
Um, so basically, it would if you have your stream stored on disk, it can iterate over the stream, find the BIREF records, and replace them with the appropriate write records. Um, and you do have to maintain this script, but the script doesn't need to consider sort of new features that get added to ZFS. Its test matrix is fixed in time. Because once DDoop is gone, you no longer have to worry about adding new test cases for it. It won't have to deal with new features or new complexities. Um, and then finally, once everything is ready and we feel secure and we feel confident about it, remove the logic from the receiving side and remove all traces of it from the code. Uh, and at this point, the feature would be gone. There would be no way to use it anymore except rehydrating your sends and then receiving them normally. Um, so obviously, this is not something that like we could, should, or want to do as like a, a declaration or a patch that we would even propose without getting a lot of feedback first. Um, this is kind of a first for the community. And we want to hear from everybody, not only about potentially doing this to this feature, but also what this protocol should look like in the future. Um, people who use the feature, other developers of ZFS, other members of the community who have feelings about how this process should go. Um, we want to talk about this and have a dialogue and figure out what the right thing to do is in the future, because it seems like at some point we are going to need to think about ways that we can stop the system from just growing endlessly. Um, at some point, we do need to think about what things should be in and out of scope and how we deal with making those changes and making those decisions. Um, so I'm really, I look forward to people asking me questions about this, talking to me about this. Um, I don't know if we have a lot of time for questions now, um, but I'll be around during the hackathon and I'm available on Slack and on IRC um, and on email and GitHub. So please send me messages. I'd love to have a conversation about this with everyone. Thank you for your time. Yeah, I think I think a few minutes for questions for comments or uh, thumbs up or down. So one question is how do we send feedback? Uh, how do we send feedback like to me? Like who should receive this feedback uh, as a community? So I feel like this should probably be a discussion that happens sort of in the open on, on in the open on some sort of public forum. And so maybe the right place is like an issue on GitHub or a message in the mailing lists. Um, and so probably the right thing to do is to look into doing something like that where we can track sort of discussion and store feedback in a way that it's actually persistent and not just me receiving a thousand emails that I will not be able to keep track of all of them and that no one else can see. Yeah. I propose that you open a ZOL uh, issue. Okay, I can open an issue on and, ZOL. And then people can... Yeah, and then people can comment and rant and yell at me on it there. Tom? Um, just as a comment, uh, I had read about a technique a while ago for deprecating things. I believe it's called uh, deprecation uh, through obnoxiousness. <laughs> okay. And for them, what it was was um, they had a function that they didn't want people to call anymore. And so, in one version of the function, they added a sneak eight in it. Nice. And it calls right after they printed or right <laughs> right after they printed a message saying, "Hey, don't don't, go, don't use this anymore." And very quickly, people stopped using that function. So that is definitely another te technique to be used, and I'm happy to I'm discuss happy the trade-offs. I just thought I'd bring that up. Sarah? Yeah, other than just, like, polling people, do you, have, do you or anyone else have any idea of how to, like, get a sense of how we use this feature is? Exactly. Yeah, it's, we don't have a good way to gather sort of usage metrics for something like this. Um, the limited evidence that I have is mostly sort of looking at uh, how bugs get discovered, like, when we do release a feature that has bugs in it. And then looking at tools like ZREPL and a couple of the automated um, other sort of data backup solutions. And none of them really take great advantage of this feature. And almost every tool that I've seen that does it doesn't use dash capital R or capital I. So they would, even if they started using it, um, only get to dedupe data within the same data set, which is, again, a relatively limited opportunity. Um, I don't have a good way to get usage numbers. And so I am really hoping that we can reach out to the community. Yeah, I don't know, uh, like a Twitter Asking on Twitter, asking on GitHub, talking in IRC or something like that to try to get a sense of how the community uses the future would be a really good thing to do. I think also about education. Like, I don't think that we necessarily are going to say, like, oh, if a lot of people are using it, then we'll keep it around. Because we kind of think that a lot of people are misusing it. Yeah. Like, a lot of people are using terrible? it, and they would be better off not using it. Right. Um, so we, we need to get more detailed information to really dissuade us from this. Yeah. That, uh, indicating that's actually super useful for somebody. Yeah. yeah. And that kind of adds to what I was going to suggest, whether it's deprecated or not. It's been a while since I looked at the man page for it, but I think there is actually a subtle implication that it is in some way related to actual DDoS. I'm sure there is. And 
cleaning that up and actually adding the explicit commentary mm -hmm. that it in fact has nothing to do with with the DDoE feature and that there's a very limited use case for yeah. it would might be an interesting start in its own right. That's definitely stuff we could take as well. Um, regardless of whether or not we decide exactly. to deprecate it, we should have yeah. command page to make it more good. Maybe the way to do it is to put the deprecation warning in saying that you know we plan to delete this in 2020 right. and see how much see whether people how respond. many people are screwed. The problem with something like that is that existing users probably aren't going to look at the man page, but it would. Right. Sort of Good point. If you yeah. Interactively, you know, yeah. if you try to use the feature, it says yeah, it's going to be just added twenty twenty unless you say otherwise. Right. Yeah, it's going to take. <laughs> that's the least that much time before you know we get the feedback. Or like feedback. you need to wait long enough that you went to a shipped version that has a deprecation warning. Yeah. For example. Um, exactly. All right. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank awesome. you very much. Thanks.